Big upset today at Twickenham as Ireland beat England. Elwood, all the kinds of dummy running, this is Danaher. Danaher out there to Wallace. Wallace to Gagan. Gagan could score. He's going to make it. It's a try for Gagan. And big surprise in Cardiff as Wales hammered France. To Walker, this will seal it. Nigel Walker all the way. Wales triumphant. And, of course, in the FA Cup so far this season, it's been upsets all the way. League as Kidderminster against West Ham, Wolves against Ipswich, and Oldham against Barnsley. Alan and Trevor here as usual to enjoy the action with us. We start with Kidderminster, only the fifth non-league club to get as far as the fifth round, at home to West Ham. The Agborough Stadium was the setting today for Clive Tilsley. Fantasy football becomes a reality thanks to the FA Cup. The Agborough Stadium in Kidderminster, the first non-league round ever to stage a fifth round tie and Kidderminster Harriers bidding to become the first non-league team ever to reach the sixth round. The story so far, a glorious goal from telephone salesman John Purdy knocked out Birmingham City in round three. Another from damp course specialist Delwyn Humphreys accounted for Preston North End in round four. I wonder if there's a part-time hero lying in wait for West Ham United in the Kidderminster team for round five. It's no ordinary non-league team, they are the current conference leaders and seven of their number do have full-time league experience. Experience and sheer will to win will be key to West Ham's chances today, so Alvin Martin's return to the centre of their defence is a sizeable bonus. They're without three other senior defenders through injury, Burrows, Gale and Webster. The Hammers' own recent cup experiences include a photo finish win over non-league Farnborough two years ago. Graham Pooley is the man in charge. FA Cup history isn't easily made. There's not much that hasn't happened in this competition over the last 124 years. But Kidderminster Harriers have a chance of breaking new ground this afternoon. A six to one chance of breaking new ground, according to the bookmakers. And talking of the ground, the pitch is in pretty good condition. Clive Allen for West Ham. Forsyth, fought by Weir, away by Alvin Martin, playing his first game for three months. They have taken a bit of a gamble on Alvin Martin today. He's only played four games in the last year because of Achilles problems. Allen to Chapman. One off the ball by the Kidderminster captain, Simeon Hodgson. This is Paul Davis. Mike Marsh. Ian Bishop. Tim Breaker steaming forward to his right. Forsyth couldn't get a foot on the ball. Breaker's done well. Marsh. He was actually the uh, Liverpool substitute for the 1992 FA Cup final, Mike Marsh, although he didn't get on against Sunderland in that game. And he had a, an early opportunity here to ease any West Ham United apprehension. And there's bound to be some. Davis up in front of uh, Martin, and here's Humphreys trying to set himself. His life hasn't been quite the same since that fourth round winner against Preston. 
that's uh, Kidderminster's leading scorer and the man most likely this afternoon. Martin Allen forced on to Lee Chapman. Mike Marsh. It's towards Clive Allen. And still, and Kevin Rose had to make a save. Can't offer him two chances. He's lethal enough with one. And a five pots. Roland, Bishop. Looking more and more relaxed, West Ham. Holmes. Martin Allen. We'll lock it by four side. Granger. Cut right. Challenge though by Roland. Bishop. Chapman. Marsh. Lovely pass. Breaker. Four waiting inside the box. Marsh. Headed by Brindley. Martin Allen. Chapman just got a touch on. Clive Allen. Certainly West Ham United are looking the prime candidates for the first goal. That uh, Chapman-Allen combination, which has been frustrated by injuries this season, starting to click. Tossed forward towards Davis. And if it was a gamble on Alvin Martin, it's a gamble that's paying off for West Ham at the moment. He's been rock solid. Here's Chapman. Martin Allen. Mike Marsh. Tim Breaker motoring forward again. It's in towards Clive Allen, and it needed a brave header from Martin Weir. Keith Rowland across to take the corner. It's towards Martin! And that would really have made his day. He'd never scored an FA Cup goal, strangely enough. He was within six inches of doing so there. It's been very reassuring to have him back at the heart of the West Ham defence today, and there's the extra bonus of what he can do in the other penalty area. will ensure that it's only a yellow card for Alvin Martin. The most promising moment yet for Kidderminster Harriers. John Purdy. All sorts of oohs and ahs, but Ludet McClosko had it covered. Maybe a range finder though from Purdy. Something to talk about during the uh, half-time interval. Something to rally around. <laughs> West Ham have had things pretty much the wrong way so far. Uh, they've had a pretty smooth passage through what could have been choppy waters. But just uh, a little reminder for them there in the final minute. Alvin Martin, the closest to scoring so far has uh, done everything asked of him on his return to the side. But John Purdy, number 11, had a glimpse of the West Ham goal there for a moment. 
and although they've had more of the ball and more of the pressure, West Ham United have got only an equal share of the half-time scoreline. It's nil-nil. Think of famous uh, non-league cup triumphs and you inevitably think of Hereford United's victory over Newcastle on match of the day back in 1972. And who were the spoil sports who put an end to that Hereford Cup run in the next round? Yes, West Ham United. Well, they needed a replay. Mike Marsh. It's come for Keith Rowland. Clive Allen trying to set himself. Well, he's had uh, three or four close scrapes now, Allen. Just about the closest yet from him. It's a nervous sort of assignment for Billy Bonds and company this afternoon. Brought by Cartwright. And here goes Humphreys. Can Pitterminster pick up where they left off at the end of the first half? Good play by Humphreys and an awkward deflection of Potts job for McClosco, it didn't have any more pace on it. Marsh. Martin Allen galloping forward. Forcing the clearance from Chris Brindley. And forcing the corner kick. Not sure the targets. Keith Rowland trying to pick one out. Chapman, Clive Allen trying to make something of it, headed by Brindley, Bishop, Rowland again, Clive Allen's in there, off the line by Simeon Hoss, captain's clearance, Rowland again, difficult start to the second half for Kidderminster, the Rangers' head are important, and Brindley's. Breaker. Forsyth. Bancroft. Hit him into the throw. Just got a touch on there in front of where keeper was committed. Off some managed to smuggle it off the line. Davis, Humphreys, hung up for Purdy, headed away by Marsh. Nice play by Bishop. Holmes. It's a bit of style about West Ham today. That's a lovely pass from Bishop. Rowland. Oh, and that important clearance. Both Chapman and Clive Allen were closing in. Weeping counter-attack from West Ham United. Breaker. Challenge was by Granger. Crosses by Marsh. Chapman waiting. Saved by Rose. Chapman again. But neither he nor Holmes could quite smuggle the ball past Kevin Rose. It was meat and drink for Lee Chapman. Certainly the first attempt, not the second sitting on the floor, but Rose juggled a bit and held on. Nothing passed him. Holmes. Tackled by Cartwright, on by Granger. Davis leading on a little bit. This is Humphreys. Delwyn Humphreys. Delwyn Humphreys. Oh. We were getting ready for the celebratory somersaults. The man whose goal beat Preston North End in the last round. Delwyn Humphreys. The best moment of the afternoon yet for Kidderminster. 
Forsyth with the corner. And that's just what you want from a goalkeeper at a moment like that. for Trevor Morley. Keith Rowland. Goalkeeper's out and has lost it. Chapman! It has been coming. And Lee Chapman, who won the day against Notts County in the last round for West Ham, has scored a vital goal here to maybe end the Kidderminster dream in round five. Uh, Kevin Rose, the goalkeeper, who's been such a factor in Kidderminster's successes, will not particularly want to see that again. Chapman's looping header just falls into an unguarded goal. Rose came and didn't get there, and Lee Chapman's 10th goal for West Ham United gives them the lead. Challenged by Potts, but on goes Purdy. Obstructed. And Potts is in trouble. Greatest free kick in towards Brindley. And Tosca a little bit more positive than his opposite number was. Hodson. Flags down. This is Purdy. Struck it pretty sweetly, but it was always rising. Forsyth. Bancroft. Switch it. Sharp challenge by Potts, got the ball. Bancroft. Humphreys, Purdy, great chance for Deakin, oh, blocked by Breaker. And he's only been on the field a couple of minutes. He was maybe still a little cold. A chance nicely etched out for him, but Tim Breaker did well to get in a challenge. And the Kidderminster Cup adventure is over. Sanity returns to the FA Cup in round five. West Ham United are through to the draw for round six. Great credit to Billy Bonsight. Lee Chapman's 21st FA Cup goal was all that separated the Premiership from the conference in the end. They're gone but not forgotten in round five of the FA Cup. It's a measure of how far you've come that you are all genuinely disappointed tonight. Yes, I mean, if we'd have lost, you know, if we'd have gone out 4 or 5 nil, then, you know, it wouldn't have been too bad. But to go out 1 nil, to, I'd say, not a very good goal. I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to go and enjoy ourselves now because we've done very well to get this far. If you'd lost, God forbid, or even drawn today, you'd have never, never heard of the end of it, would you? Well, it, it, I think that's what scares a professional more than anything else. It's the humiliation of being beaten by a non-league team. Uh, you'd never live it down. It'd be with you for the rest of your career. And the longer the game went on today, um, I, I just thought, are we going to see one of these 30-yard specials that these non-league teams produce now and again? And I just thought, as long as it was nil-nil, obviously they had a, a chance of pulling one out of the bag. And uh, when we got that goal, it, it took a lot of the pressure off us. Your old team would be happy to get through that at the first time of asking, Trevor. It was close, really. Yeah, it was. I mean, I was uh, quite relieved to be sitting here this evening, not having to explain what went wrong. I mean, you know, first half West Ham, I thought, dominated. Second half, Kidderminster came back. But I think in the end, possibly the little bit of experience West Ham had at both ends made the difference. Well, Chapman continues to get those important goals, although that, that was a pretty easy one for Well, him. yes. I mean, but, you know, he got one against Notts County. Again, you know, he held up play once or twice very well. But I thought at the other end, Alvin Martin was outstanding. I mean, it was a bit of a gamble by Billy Bonds to bring him back to today. You know, been out for three months. There he is back in 1980. Collecting his cup final. You're going to pop medal. up here in a minute? Chuck? No, fortunately not. <laughs> Wish I looked as young as that. Let's say I've been today. 
a little bit thinner on top as you can see but still as competitive uh, this was in the first half uh, and an attacking header and well he couldn't have got much closer there but um, he had been out for three months so it was a gamble and it showed a bit here does yeah, he might have we thought he might have got sent off for, for well, a I moment think, this afternoon I think he was going for the ball he was a little bit late but Tim Baraker there running alongside John Purdy was the key man because I think he could have got a tackle in anyway but I think in the whole afternoon this was the, the one incident which which turned the match it was nil nil 15 minutes into this second half there's Alvin Martin picking himself up he sensed danger then he doesn't just sit on the floor and watch what's happened Humphreys turns inside and that's a great tackle with his left foot he made up a lot of ground and as I say nil nil at that stage and then they're one nil up now 15 minutes to go he shows his experience this is why Billy Bonds did bring him into the team you know, on these situations, you don't want to concede possession. Here he's on his own touchline and then just gently knocks it back to his goalkeeper and it eats up a bit of time. And one of the great things I used to find when I used to play with him as a midfield player is his, his use of the ball from the back. And here, late on in the game, rather than just head it formed with aimlessly, knocks it down, a beautiful cushion header back to Keith Rowland and again West Ham retain possession. And I'm not surprised, I mean, Billy Bonds played alongside him in that 1980 final and a good pat on the back. For Alvin and also for Bill for picking him, I think. It's a bit of a gamble, as I say, but he did extremely well. He's had a good career. From the Agra Stadium now to the stadium that Jack built. Sir Jack Hayward has spent 15 million on making Molyneux, the famous home of Wolverhampton Wanderers, one of the best grounds in the country. Wolves from Division One were at home to Ipswich from the Premier League, and watching them was John Motson. It's 19 years since John Walk made his debut for Ipswich Town in an FA Cup tie and 16 years since he collected a winner's medal. Ipswich's opponents in that semi-final of 1978 were a West Brom side that included Cyril Regis, who faces Walk again today. Regis has been recalled by Wolves because Steve Bull is injured and like Walk, he is in his 37th year. Wolves are also still without Jeff Thomas, like Bull, a long-term absentee with a knee injury. So it's the side that lost to South End last week, the end of a long, unbeaten run. Two recent arrivals in midfield, number seven, Chris Marsden from Huddersfield, and number eight, Darren Ferguson, son of the Manchester United manager. Ipswich, like Wolves, are the draw experts in their division. It's the team that started at Everton last week, a game that ended nil-nil. They're captained by David Linnigan, whose brother Andy scored the goal that won the cup last season, and the top scorer is Ian Marshall, who has found the net in all Ipswich's three FA Cup ties so far. Steve Lodge of Barnsley gets this cup tie started. Wolves in the famous old gold and black, and the stadium looking full towards its 28,000 capacity at kickoff. Record gate receipts already confirmed of over £200,000. And I can only say that the new Molyneux is a very impressive structure indeed. Beautifully redesigned and rebuilt this ground. And a good atmosphere for a cut tie. Number five there is Paul Blades for Wolves. Ipswich playing right to left in the first half. They've brought about 3,000 supporters from Suffolk. And number three is Neil Thompson. And that's Kiwomya. And that's Slater at number 21. He tried to find Palmer. Kiwomya and Wolves just forced back a bit at the start here by the Premiership side. Kiwomya, who's been out of the side recently, is very determined to do well today. Here he is. He's come back to Thompson. Slater. Palmer moves it inside. Geraint Williams in the attack there. This is Marshall. And it fell back for Yards. Eddie Yards taking up a midfield position at the start. And uh, Regis gets the free kick. Thompson penalised.
Shirtliff and Venus go forward again. Kelly's up for this, so is Shirtliff. This is Marsden. That's Slater for Ipswich. He's dwelling a bit, but he had the skill to do it. Kiwamia, Stockwell. He's keen to Marsden. Kelly starts his run now. Wolf. That's fallen for Kiwamia. He's got Palmer up with him. Here's Palmer. Williams. Well, Geraint Williams has yet to score for Ipswich in over 70 appearances. And uh, he wasn't going to break his duck like that. Thompson for Wolves. It was Walks somewhat slice clear. It's ranking got to it number four. And again. Kelly in the centre, so is Regis. Ferguson's there as well. Given away by Neil Thompson. Marsden. Rankin. Good ball. Rankin. Oh, that was the best effort so far. And the expression suggests it was very close from Mark Rankin. Marsden here, good left foot, sets the play up. Slide rule pass. Rankin let the ball run and then fired across the goal and just wide. There goes Kiwamia up against Shirtliff. But he's too knowledgeable, the Wolves captain, to get beaten like that. This is Palmer picking up the loose one. Marshall waiting for Stuart Slater. And that strikes Shirtley. Well, it's a corner now. Rankin uh, with his back to the play. Slater pressing up against him. Now that we've got Linigan and Walk have come up. Exciting 60 seconds of football was about two goalkeepers. 
Stowell of Wolves, who came for the corner, and uh, he had Chris Kiwamia initially standing in front of him when it was swung in. He got past him, he made the punch, but look at that, it's John Walk, who scored many goals in his time, perhaps not too many easier than that, but you have to be there to get them. And at the other end, Walk's own goalkeeper, Craig Forrest, made a very good stop from Andy Thompson. Ferguson. The two strikers crossing over now. Marsden. Thompson's made some good runs down that left-hand side. He's brought John Walk across to cover. Two waiting in the middle, and it's a corner. Well, Ipswich went in front from a corner. Can Wolves make use of one now? Oh, it's come off Marshall. Shirtliff! Oh, yeah, outrageous! A narrow escape for Ipswich. The near post corner works again. It's actually Ian Marshall who heads it up into the air, but Shirtliff gets his head to it. It's away by Yalds, it's over from Regis. Forward by Thompson. Stockwell meets the challenge. Crowd get behind Wolves. Thompson. Now, he's onside. Chance to cross. Regis up with... Oh, he's missed at the keeper. Kelly! Oh, how did they get that away? Well, Forrest thinks he was fouled. And for a man of six foot four to get knocked about like that, there had to be some kind of impact. It was Regis in the thick of it. And at half-time, the Premiership side had the edge, thanks to the man whose goal took them to Wembley in 1978, John Walk. The passage of time doesn't seem to have affected his enthusiasm or his ability to be in the right place at the right time. There is a certain sadness around Molyneux as well today because of the death this morning of little Johnny Hancocks, the famous right winger from the 50s. Older viewers will remember how he frightened the life out of the likes of Spartak and Honved in those matches here at the old Molyneux when the screen in the corner was a flickering black and white picture. Ferguson. Challenged by Linigan. Now Rankin. Thompson! Oh, what a save by Craig Forrest! Andy Thompson will need to see it again to believe it. And the Canadian goalkeeper responds here to a cross first by Rankin. A header by Andy Thompson was going in the corner. And what a great flying save. Marsden takes the corner. Shirt lifts in there. Corner again. Now, this is the real test for Ipswich. Forrest dug them out there. <laughs> Venus comes off walk. Ferguson! What happened there? Well, Darren Ferguson, a left-footed player, made some kind of connection with his right ear. Um, it's a... Poorish header by John Walk in fairness, and then Ferguson gets the... Well, it's just scrambled round. Corner again. Shirtlift's there. Ferguson's there as well, and Ipswich are scrambling a bit back there. There's argument between the goalkeeper and the men in front of him. Keane. Marsden. Regis closing in now. Goalkeeper Kane. Heels for handball, nothing given. Kawanya on the break, danger. Well, not with a pass like that, there isn't. David Linigan. 
it's a good cut try now. Well, over 28,000 people held their breath when Craig Forrest flung himself across his goal to meet this header from Andy Thompson. He was on one foot one minute, and then the spring takes him right across, and a clawing left hand, great save. Again, he just knit the play nicely in midfield. The number seven. This is Keane. Good effort, good save again. But here's Kelly side netting, goal kick. I wouldn't think that rough patch in the penalty area really helps the goalkeeper when the ball's fizzing through, which it did then from Kevin Keane. And Forrest scrambled it away, and it was Kelly's effort. Well, time is running out a bit for Wolves. We're into the last ten minutes. Thompson to Kelly. There goes Ferguson. Williams is with him. There's some bumping and boring. Well played by Geraint Williams. Blades, Marsden. Regis, Kelly, goal! It's David Kelly, and it's 1-1. And the Wolves supporters get the moment they've been waiting for. They had to wait until the 82nd minute for it, but the goal has come at last, and David Kelly, who by his standards has been going through a lean spell in front of goal, gets the assistance here of big Cyril Regis. That's the layoff they were working for. It's an angled shot for Kelly, and he fires it beyond Forrest. And Wolves may have saved this cup tie with barely eight minutes to go. And now listen to the noise inside the new Molyneux. They've always loved a cup match here, especially when Wolves score. Regis had a hand in the move. Intelligence, experience, play. Venus. Regis again. Dennison. Kelly's there again. Oh. He came in between two defenders. And Ipswich protest because Stephen Lodge is given a corner. Now then, it's going to be taken by Keane. Wolves are starting to believe that anything's possible here. Shirtly up with Marshall, and away by Slater. Venus. Just look at them piling in again, and Ipswich are having it all on to stem the tide. It's, <laughs> it's Slater for Ipswich. They haven't got out their own half very much this last half hour. But they'll get out there now to free kick. Now, did Kelly head this ball or was it an Ipswich player? It was a floated cross by Robbie Dennison. Well, it was given as a corner. But David Kelly's is the name that's reverberating around Molyneux because when Cyril Regis set that up, Kelly fired, well, it went really underneath the foot of Forrest, but with power. So we've now got Gwenchev up front with Marshall. Regis heads on, Kelly. Regis! And here comes Thompson. Slater and Cyril Regis at the near post nearly wrote his name all over it
chucked inside. Uh -oh. That was Palmer, it was heavy. That's a free kick to Wolves. I wouldn't have thought Ipswich would relish defending against this in stoppage time. Everybody's piling in. Taken by Keane. Regis is in there. He's still in there. It's Cyril Regis. And he got the shot in as much as he could must have a very sporting moment there between Regis and Steve Palmer. It's been a good match and it's been very well contested and Cyril Regis has relished being in the thick of the action again. It goes back to Portman Road on Wednesday week. The draw experts from their respective divisions have produced a draw but an exciting one. John Walk, the scorer in the first half for Ipswich but the other veteran, Cyril Regis, made a goal for this man, David Kelly, eight minutes from time. So the Ensley League side force a replay. And John Walk walks off with a smile on his face. Ipswich will have home advantage, but Regis enjoyed it too. So did the capacity crowd, paying record receipts inside the new Molyneux. Well, John, 16 years ago, I saw you score in the semi-final against West Bromwich Albion and Cyril Regis, and you're still at it today. Yeah, I enjoyed this one today, actually. See, it dropped nice for me, and I put it away, and I thought that was going to sort of win the tie for us, but second half, we had to defend very, very good. It was a long assault from Wolves, wasn't it? And you finally cracked eight minutes from the end. Yeah, I thought our goalkeeper was magnificent. You know, he'd done a lot of good saves and just kept us in the tie. But as I say, we've got them back at Portman Road, and hopefully we can get the right result. Well, Craig, I'm looking up at you here, and uh, the people have, since the end of the match have been going on and on about the save you made in the second half from uh, Andy Thompson's header. Just give me your verdict on that. Uh, well, my verdict is it happens very quickly, and the ball came in. It was a great header, and uh, you know, you just move your feet as quickly as possible and try and get to it, and uh, I was glad to see it just go around the post. Well, Cyril, uh, battle of the veterans in some ways, you and John Walk. Who won in the end? Well, uh, the results say it's a draw, but it was a tremendous game. Uh, John got a goal and I set uh, one up for equaliser. Uh, atmosphere was superb and uh, we're looking forward to getting it in a couple of weeks' time. Now, with eight minutes to go, 1-0 down, it looked as if it was a bit desperate for Wolves. That's right, but uh, second half, the lads played really well, took the game to it, which uh, the keeper made a magnificent save of Andy Thompson. Uh, we kept going and we got a just reward, really. Wide open cup time still remains, so I would guess so. Yeah, I thought Wolves played well. They had the better the chances and they thoroughly deserved the draw. Mm -hmm. And what about the goalkeeping performances? Well, it was a mixture of good and bad, wasn't it? This is a, the Ipswich first goal. You've got Kawami in front of still here, and I think he puts him off. A little push there, another push, he goes, he can't quite get there. The goal's wide open and John Watt puts it in the back of the net. This is 30 seconds later, and the person to watch here is Thompson, who makes a great run. Regis goes up. Thompson loses his marker, and when the ball comes to him in the box, he does everything right, but Forrest stands up well and makes a magnificent block. And this one has got to be save of the day. It's a ball that come in from Rankin, a Thompson header, and he just stretches magnificently to his left-hand side and plucks it at the top corner to push it away. Absolutely tremendous. But for me, I think he should have saved the Wolves goal. A nice little touch from Sol Regis into David Kelly. I think he goes feet first here, and if he stands up, I think he'll save it. Maybe a little bit harsh on him because he was terrific in the day. The senior pros are having a good time today. We mentioned uh, Alvin uh, in the West Ham match and we got Walk and Regis in this one. Yeah, so Regis had his moments today, but I thought John Walk was superb. I think for reading of the game, you'll go a long way to see anybody better than he was today. And you played with him, of course, at Liverpool. Well, you've got to give him a mention, haven't you? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, uh, we've uh, highlighted two goalkeepers in that match, but there was, of course, a third goalkeeper taking uh, uh, in action at uh, Molyneux today. Um, here he is. Winter Olympics is the clue. 1988 games to be exact. He was a, a hero then and as you see he's a natural athlete. Um, he is of course unmistakably Eddie the Eagle. There he is. Still a star. <laughs> well now another premiership against first division tie. Oldham against Barnsley. Oldham so close to the final four years ago losing a semi-final replay to Manchester United you recall. Barnsley now under the guidance of Viv Anderson, a finalist last year with Sheffield Wednesday. The commentator is Tony Gubber. Three seasons ago here at Boundary Park, Neil Redfern scored the injury time penalty that won Oldham the second division championship. 
but he was transferred four months later and today returns as the top goal scorer in a Barnsley team looking to add another Premiership scalp to the 15 already dumped out of the FA Cup. Well, Oldham's only team change today was predictable with Sean McCarthy cup tied. Darren Beckford will be up front with Graham Sharp, who has scored a goal in a Wembley Cup final in Everton's success in 1984. The Cup is a welcome distraction for Barnsley, who face a relegation struggle at the bottom of Division 1. They're unchanged from the team which won 3-0 against Stoke last Saturday. They'll play with three at the back. Redfern, number eight, will be in midfield, the role that he wanted at Oldham but couldn't get. Number seven, Brendan O'Connell, will tuck in behind the front two. John Watson of Whitley Bay is the referee. It's the fifth round of the FA Cup. It's Lancashire versus Yorkshire. It's the only all-Northern tie. And two sides meeting here who consider themselves virtually Derby opponents, just the Pennines separating them. Oldham in their blue shirts, Barnsley in the red shirts and black shorts. With Anderson now 37 capped 30 times as an England player enjoying his first taste of management here's Rick Holden knocks in an early cross Beckford didn't get to it and here's Redfern the former Oldham player who will be revelling in the atmosphere and also excited at the chance to show Joe Royal that he made a mistake in transferring him Craig Fleming getting involved. Nine is Andy Rammel, trying to find a bit of space. And he does, Rammel's headed down, it rebounded. Holden's attempted clearance came back off Rammel, and it's behind for a goal kick. But Rammel might have made more of that. A player picked up from non-league football by Alex Ferguson some time ago and taken to Old Trafford although he never got into Manchester United's first team and then moved on finally to Barnsley. Here's Darren Beckford. Back very deep. Oh, he's given it to Peyton. Hallworth's on the floor. Peyton ended up on the floor as well and he's running to the referee. But Mr Watson saw no offence in that and now an offside. And there's a feverish argument going on. Andy Peyton, furious with the referee, feels that that should have been a penalty. It was certainly very lax by John Hallworth, but was there an offence? O'Connell underneath, it helps it on, Peyton's there. Fleming didn't clear it, it's loose, Eaton. Wilson! There wasn't a lot of pace on it, otherwise John Hallworth would have been beaten. Danny Wilson, the player coach, with the shot and Hallworth with just enough time to get down and stop it with his right arm. Nicky Eden, who had the initial shot. But that's the closest, really, that we've come to a score with just over half an hour played. Barnsley have built quite a reputation as a battling cup side in the last few seasons. They've reached this fifth round five times in the last ten seasons. Only once progressing any further. Holden hasn't really got away down this left side yet, and there are two on him in a flash. Break is here by Bernard. Oh, it just slipped, but he kept possession. Didn't find Beckford, here's Sharp! Lays it back. Saw Pedersen who had the shot. Sharp was in a good position. And again, the ball was stuck under his feet for a moment. Played back to the Norwegian. And it was a good stop by Butler. Peyton. Fleming marks him, still Peyton onto his right foot. It was well placed, and Hallworth pulled off a spectacular save. There didn't seem to be a lot of pace behind it. Elbow. 
Bernard's header. Then Milligan. Then Sharp. Macon. It's Fleming. Again, it was easy for Barnsley to deal with. Rammel nicely directed down to O'Connell. Again, they've piled red shirts in there. It's loose. The shot was by Andy Payton. He's protesting to the referee that there might have been a hand involved in stopping that. But it was point blank. Came off Jobson, and it was Jobson who charged it down. Fleming down for Wilson, who didn't get it. Milligan got there first. Sharp. It's a good break by Oldham. They've got player spare. Bernard. Pedersen goes outside him. They're inside the penalty area. What can he deliver? Into the near post. And it was Mick Milligan, the captain, who arrived. And he's getting a mouthful from Darren Beckford. But that was one of the few occasions when Oldham have had the extra player. And Milligan tried to back heel it as Beckford came in. Beckford, still Beckford, off the post by Paul Bernard, and it's Barnsley's turn to survive a scare, Redfern didn't keep his feet, a free kick is given, and it's a moment for everybody to catch their breath, including the commentator, Darren Beckford showing his strength, out wide, came inside the defender, looked up to see that Paul Bernard had arrived, delivered it to the older number 11, and he hit the woodwork. Andy Ritchie, now 33, on as a replacement for Neil MacDonald. Well, he played 20 matches earlier in the season, Andy Ritchie, but he's been out for the last five, and now on as a second-half substitute as Oldham try to win this match at home, which is increasingly looking like a replay at Oakwell. Redfern hoisted in, left-footed. Danny Wilson. Well, he hit it well and he hit it through. It needed a good save, maybe a, an ounce more. Speed on the ball would have beaten Hallworth. Well, that's a good long kick. That's fallen nicely for Ritchie, just on the edge of the area. Ritchie's broken the deadlock. The substitute only on the field for three or four minutes. And he gives Oldham the lead. Sharp, who got across, it came off Taggart, the captain, and it was perfect for Ritchie. He didn't need inviting twice. Still, Joe Royal's face isn't creased by a smile, but he must be happier now. Here's Andy Ritchie, the goal scorer. Look how quickly Barsley are at him. But he's got it out to Bernard. Good cross in. Came back off the woodwork by Richard Jobson. Tremendous header one in the air by the Oldham number five. The whistle's already gone, the players can't hear it. Well, Richard Jobson, always up for the set pieces. Great header to win, and denied by the crossbar. It's going to take something desperate and dramatic if Barnsley had to salvage something. O'Connell. Left foot sharp, there were three in the middle, and it was on the near post. Referee has checked his watch, and Barnsley's cup run may be over. Sharp goes outside them. And making it difficult for Lee Butler to kick up field, where they've now got three permanently positioned Holden puts it out 
must have deflected off the defender because the throw is given to Oldham. Joe Royal, the more animated of the two managers as we move towards stoppage time. Here's Taggart. Oh, Redfern, he's given it to Darren Beckford. Beckford! Butler saved it and finally scooped it out to Taggart. It would have been all over then. Here comes Taggart, powering forward. Play waved on, Wilson knocks it out. Knocked in by Eden. O'Connell missed it, now it's loose. O'Connell. Oh, finally out by Fleming. And there's a flag up on this far side, an offside to Oldham relief. What a scrap it's been. through this one with a 1-0 victory and that's the result the substitute Andy Ritchie with that goal in just over an hour of play sending Oldham through into the quarter-finals for the first time since their cup run of 1990 when they went on to the semi-final Oldham will feel it's been a bright, cheery afternoon. It's been an exciting, pulsating cup tie. Barnsley played their part, but in the end just couldn't fashion a goal. But it's not an afternoon when anyone will complain about the level of entertainment. Oldham won, Barnsley nil. You seem to have been around a long time. What is it now, 33 and holding? Yeah, I'm 33, my hair's 84. But, uh... <laughs> Uh, but if you can score yeah. goals like that, nobody minds. Well, no, I mean, I, you know, since uh, since I had my back uh, operated on, I've, I've felt great. And just recently, I've been feeling probably as good as I, as I felt before I, I had to have the operation. So I'm just getting back into it. It's been a long haul, but, uh, you know, I feel as though I'm fit enough and I could go on to, you know, who knows, I might be catching my old mate Ray Wilkins up. And the silly question always is, who do you fancy in the next round? I don't really think you, man, you, you, you know, it matters. I mean, obviously, if we, if we can keep away from Man United, that would be nice, but uh, as long as we get a home, home tie, uh, I don't think that we've got anybody else to fear, really. Well done, Andy. What do you think, Oldham for the cup? You'll only get 10 to 1. 10 to 1's the figure now. Aren't yeah, I'm afraid yeah. my 50 pence will be going elsewhere, Des, but... It's not going, man. No, I don't think it'll be going Oldham to win, but if they have a good run in the cup, then I definitely think it'll help their cause in the Premiership. Take Sheffield United last season, they got the semi-final, I think that helped them stay up. They might do the same for Oldham this season. That's a good point. Trevor? I thought Barnes were a bit unlucky. First down, they were the better side. And, uh, you know, a win there would have helped them in their relegation battle they've got sure. in Division 1. That was a close, another close one. Now, the other cup information uh, for you. Bristol City and Charlton drew 1-1 in the all-first division tie at Ashton Gate. Brian Tinian, who scored City's winner at Liverpool in round three, gave them an early lead from a free kick. And Charlton, Blackburn's conquerors in the last round, and a replay through Mark Robson. For Chelsea, Dennis Wires was back in the side at Oxford, who shot Leeds in round four. They went ahead after five minutes through Joey Beecham. Chelsea's scorers were John Spencer and Craig Burley. Oxford's chances of saving the game went in the closing minutes when their captain, Mike Ford, hit the crossbar from the penalty spot. The start of the second half was delayed six minutes by crowd trouble. Police took horses and dogs on the pitch to sort it out. Now Chelsea are in the quarterfinals for the second time in three seasons, but Glenn Hoddle says the priority is to stay in the Premiership. And incidentally, the goals of those two ties you'll see at halftime tomorrow in our live match. Well, there was also plenty of Premier League action today. Here are the goals now, starting with second place Blackburn at home to Newcastle United. League leaders Manchester United would have welcomed the Newcastle victory as eagerly as Geordie fans themselves today. They so nearly went ahead through a magnificent lob from Peter Beardsley. Blackburn goalkeeper Tim Flowers wouldn't have smiled had it dropped under and not over the bar. Newcastle did manage to keep Alan Shearer off the score sheet today, though. Shearer looking to equal a Premiership record of scoring in seven consecutive matches. The Blackburn striker could have side-footed goal 29 midway through the first half. The result was settled late in the game. 
David Batty headed the ball back towards the six-yard box. David May's volley was a worthy match winner. Blackburn now have 10 wins in the draw from their last 11 matches. It's 28 games played for both Blackburn and Manchester United. The points difference is seven. Blackburn go to Norwich on Tuesday. To come, Blackburn versus Manchester United at Ewood Park early in April. Arsenal are in the shake-up for a European place, but are now 12 points adrift of Blackburn in third. Their increasing arrears a result of five straight draws. It could have been worse today, though, had Everton striker Brett Angel's shot hit the net instead of the bar after 23 minutes. Preki off target with the follow-up. So a piece of good fortune for Arsenal on a day when their own finishing was all too often wide of the mark. Paul Merson was the exception. His aim was true. His 56th-minute goal quite magnificent. But Tony Cotty came off the bench to level it nine minutes from time. Ricochets are plenty in the box. Cotty's bullet finish for his 16th goal of the season. His sights now on a permanent place in the starting lineup. It was the goalkeepers that took centre stage at Elland Road. Bruce Grobelar won't be happy with the punch he threw at Gary McAllister's free kick. It went straight to David Weatherall, and Leeds were ahead ten minutes into the game. For Liverpool, Clough, Walters and Nickel made way for Matteo Ruddock and Redknapp. And still looking for their first win under new manager Roy Evans, the Liverpool players could only applaud John Lukic's save from John Barnes's volley early in the second half. Lukic recalled at the expense of Mark Beanie, he justified the decision. At the other end, Grobelar was at fault with another McAllister effort, brilliant in saving from David White, but helpless when the Liverpool defence allowed McAllister to run and run and run into the penalty area. When the shot eventually came in, it was deflected by Steve McManaman, secured Leeds' first win for two months, and 40,000 saw it. Francis Lee's takeover of Manchester City gave their fans optimism for the long-term future of the club. Two games unbeaten since his arrival, and the short-term hopes of avoiding relegation look promising. But David Rennie's header was one of four second-half goals for Coventry, as the Manchester club were told in no uncertain terms to re-evaluate those short-term plans. Rennie's first goal for Coventry was followed by Mick Wynn's first of the year. 75 minutes had gone when Alan Kernigan's clearance was charged down by Rennie. His cross was met by Quinn's diving header. That was greeted by a new line in salutes to celebrate the end of his barren spell. Two more followed in the last three minutes as Coventry notched their highest total of the season. John Williams, whose pace menaced the visitors' defence throughout, lashed home a splendid third. Then he played Peter Unlove through for the fourth in injury time, thus inflicting on Manchester City their heaviest defeat of the season. They stay in deep trouble, third from bottom. And there was a real cracker of a match at the county ground. Swindon will never lie down. Their fight to retain their Premier League status will continue. They went behind after 15 minutes today to Chris Sutton's 21st goal of the season. Brian Kilcline may feel he was fouled, but the asking price for Sutton will remain high. Norwich insists they won't sell. Norwich were convinced a Swindon equaliser three minutes later was offside, though. But Sean Taylor found the ball at his feet. No flag, no whistle. The goal stood and it was 1-1. And there was still plenty of action before half-time. Sutton can score goals, he can make them. His neat cross on the turn volleyed in by Rob Newman. Swindon's response was right on the whistle. There was time for an equaliser. Nicky Summerby's cross, Jan Fjortoft's header. It was only weeks ago that, having failed to score, the talk was all about Fjortov going back to Norway on loan. Since then, he can't stop scoring. Five minutes into the second half, again from the Summerby cross, Fjortov did it again. Facing the wrong way, he was still able to supply the perfectly angled header. 3-2 for Swindon, and the Norwegian's record now reads seven goals in five games. He can kiss the Fjords goodbye for a while. Three points would have lifted Swindon off the bottom of the table for the first time this season. As their fans waited for the moment, they had to reorganise. Goalkeeper John Sheffield had to go off injured. Nicky Hammond had to quickly warm up. He made an early save from Fjortoft again, but could only push Ian Crook's brilliant chip onto the bar. Goss pounced, there were seven minutes left, and the scores were level again. 
Krupp had measured the chip to absolute perfection, to the centimetre, and it was Goss who was alert to the rebound. Norwich's impressive away record wasn't damaged too much. Six goals, still time for drama. Moncur, Krupp and Goss, centre stage in the centre circle. It was infectious, suddenly there were 20-odd players involved. Plenty of pushing and shoving and much worse, but who would get carded to pay the penalty? Surprisingly, referee Roger Gifford took a lenient view. Jeremy Goss, for one, would be relieved, having shouldered the responsibility of letting Moncur know exactly what he thought of him. The referee kept his cards close to his chest, but there were six goals to enjoy. Now, the league position, the win today for Blackburn has cut Manchester United's lead at the top to seven points, with the two sides now level on games played. The chasing pack have lost more ground, with Arsenal drawing, Liverpool and Newcastle both losing. Now, at the other end, um, you'll see in due course that Swindon remain bottom of the table, but now it's only goal difference which separates them from Sheffield United. Manchester City's heavy defeat by Coventry has left them in the relegation zone with a real fight on their hands as well. So we're all looking forward to tomorrow afternoon, the uh, live cup tie at Burnden Park, Bolton Wanderers against Aston Villa. We've got the quarter-final draw for you live, of course, and uh, just remember that Wimbledon play Manchester United as well and Cardiff play Luton tomorrow, so we'll have action from uh, those matches as well for you. Just a word with the boys before we go. Who do you fancy for the live one tomorrow? Well, I fancy Villa, but I can't say I'm ultra-confident. I think it's wide open, an exciting game in prospect. Mm. I think it's going to be good footballing, Trevor, isn't it? I think, I mean, I, I think they're going to have to really do well to hold the Bolton. I mean, I've been very impressed against you know, the two previous rounds, so a it's great game tight. in store. Thank you. Well, it might have been a day for the underdogs in rugby today, in the Cup. It was more a day for the old dogs. See you tomorrow. for Richie, just on the edge of the area. Richie's broken the deadlock. It's towards Martin. Well, that would really have made his day. It'd be very reassuring to have him back at the heart of the West Ham defence today, and there's the extra bonus of what he can do in the other penalty area. Keith Rowland. Goalkeeper's out and has lost it. Chapman. And Lee Chapman who won the day against Notts County in the last round for West Ham. Has scored a vital goal here to maybe end the Kidderminster dream in round five.